Hey, hey, everybody. If you're listening to this, you are listening to the first free hour of this episode of The Shift with Doug McKenty. If you like what you're hearing, please consider subscribing to the show in order to access the full feature-length versions of the podcast, as well as have access to the members' forum, where we discuss potential topics and interviews and dive deep into the overall concept of The Shift. For only six bucks a month, not only do you get the full-length episodes, but also an opportunity to co-create with me, your host, Doug McKenty, the future of the show. Go to www.theshiftnow.com or patreon.com backslash the shift and sign up today in order to help make the shift possible. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Good morning, noon, or night, wherever and whenever you are listening, you are listening to The Shift. I'm your host. My name is Doug McKenty. This episode was recorded on December 8th, 2021. Today on the program, I'm happy to announce my guest, J. Todd Ring, author of the blog Enlightened Democracy on Substack, as well as the book Enlightened Democracy, Visions for a New Millennium. Recent essays include On Anarchy, Freedom versus Fascism, as well as Why the Left Libertarians Are Right. Todd's work expresses a real concern for the state of the current political left's trend towards authoritarianism and harkens back to the roots of philosophical liberalism, which traditionally advocated for strict boundaries on state and corporate power through the promotion of the fundamental tenets of individual liberty, characteristic of social democracy. Over the past few years, we have witnessed an explosion in state power under the rubric of public safety. Many governments around the world have discarded basic human rights such as the right to freedom of assembly, the right to freedom of speech, and even the right to inform consent enshrined within the Nuremberg Code created to ensure the horrors of Nazi Germany could never again be repeated. Many on the progressive left have embraced these measures as necessary for the public good, despite multiple examples throughout history where such excuses have preceded the destruction of democratic norms resulting in dictatorship and often devolving into genocide. It is even suggested that proponents for preservation of individual boundaries against state power are selfish or that those whose opinions differ from those of the state are unscientific or even extremist. Todd's work seeks to remind those who identify with the political left that they participate in a tradition with deep philosophical ties with classical liberal concepts that cherish the individual's ability to make personal choices for themselves and advocate for the same courtesy and respect to be given to others. He reminds us that fighting for individual liberties has always been the bedrock of liberal political theory and time and time again has proven the most beneficial for communities and individuals alike. Conversely, Todd warns of the consistently devastating results produced by authoritarian regimes when individual boundaries are not properly enforced, and laments that many in the modern-day left have forgotten their foundational origins in left libertarianism. This conversation seeks to invite many from all across the political spectrum to remember our common roots within the classical liberal tradition. While certainly not all political disagreements can be solved through the lens of any singular political philosophy, the left libertarian movement invites all who are interested in decentralizing the power of corporate and government monopolies. This can be achieved through the empowerment of local communities, where contentious political philosophies can be debated, and a variety of systems employed that represent the feelings of each and preserves a diversity of political expression through local autonomy. Find out more about the work of J. Todd Ring at www.jtoddring.substack.com. As always, find out more about The Shift, sign up for the newsletter, and discover hours of free content by visiting www.theshiftnow.com. You can also go to Doug McKenty on Facebook, at D. McKenty on Twitter, or check out The Shift with Doug McKenty on Rockfin, Odyssey, and all your favorite podcast distribution outlets. Please like, subscribe, and share this interview on all your social media accounts as we rely on listeners like you to distribute this alternative information. I'd like to thank J. Todd Ring for agreeing to this interview, and thank you for helping to make the shift.
Hey, everybody, and welcome to this, the 99th episode of The Shift. I'm your host, Doug McKinty. I am joined today by blogger and philosopher J. Todd Ring. I came across his stuff on Twitter a few weeks back. Uh, He had an article out about left libertarianism, and I've been interested, as you all know, on this program of really diving into this concept, what is left libertarianism? My hope is that it can become a kind of a big tent for a lot of people to be able to fall into, people who are interested uh, in fighting uh, what Todd describes straight up. Another reason why I wanted to have him on the show as a, a corporate fascist uh, revolution or coup that's really been taking place for a long, long time, but is culminating right now. So we're going to dive pretty deep uh, into all of these concepts. What is left libertarianism? What's going on right now? And what are some of the potential solutions uh, throughout this interview? So uh, welcome to The Shift. Todd, thanks for coming on. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. How are you? Doing all right. Having a rainy day here in Northern California, which uh, we always need the water. So I'm happy that it, our winter time is actually more like a normal winter this year. So you want to just take a couple of minutes to describe uh, your history, uh, maybe uh, some of the books. I know you've written a few books in the blog, Enlightened Democracy, that you're writing. What are your What are your major talking points? What is some of your history? Just uh, give a little bit of your background for the audience before we begin. Uh, okay. Um, where do I begin with that? Let's see. Um, went to university to study science. I uh, didn't know what I wanted to do like science, so I did that. Uh, mm-hmm. Dropped a physics course when... Uh, uh, I found there was too much math. I could do the math, but it was not very interesting to me. I looked at the course calendar and came across uh, philosophy. It seemed like, uh, you know, study of the nature of being and reality, similar to physics in a different angle, and uh, absolutely galvanized me. read Plato's Parable of the Cave. It was like a bucket of ice water. uh, Right. Great. Yeah. So launched into um, uh, political theory and philosophy as you know the passion um uh two books out um first one uh it's titled enlightened democracy visions for a new millennium uh that was 2014 <clears throat> uh it's funny now there's this hyper fascination with everything that has happened over the last like two weeks you know <laughs> This is widespread conception that anything that took place or was published, you know, more than two weeks ago is totally irrelevant. Right. You know, obviously, you know, Socrates should still be felt to be relevant. I mean, profoundly relevant. So uh, just a little footnote. Uh, The second book was um, The People Versus the Elite was the title. Mm -hmm. A Manifesto for Democratic Revolution uh, or Survival in the 21st Century and Beyond. And there's a third book uh, coming out, uh, should be out soon, uh, that's titled All Hell Breaks Loose, Global Geopolitics, 1945 to 2045. Great. We're looking at a global analysis uh, with a historical perspective and with a look at where are the trends going right now. I obviously don't have a crystal ball, but there are very clear trends shaping up. Some of them are really dark and some of them are really hopeful. So that should be an interesting read. I'd say all three of them are very interesting reads. And, and then it, uh, the blog as well. Right. I uh, started out on Blogspot, moved over to WordPress. Uh, there's a total of over 700 uh, articles now published um, between Blogspot, WordPress, and uh, Substack. I moved on to just recently. Great. So there's a lot there. So my my focus has been on. Uh, Political and social analysis, um, historical analysis, uh, philosophy, political philosophy. Um, but you know what I've been talking about and writing about for three decades now. I've been warning people about uh, two th- big things. One is you know what now is self-evident to pretty much everybody is that you know we're in an environmental crisis. And we have to take it seriously. Um, without, I would emphasize resorting to authoritarian measures which is what the Davos elite want you know that that is not the answer that mm-hmm. should be very clear but we still have we have a very real environmental crisis and i've been warning uh since 1990 that we were heading towards um the corporate takeover of government <clears throat> which has which is the merger of 
uh, 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 the business elites in government is where we were headed, which Mussolini himself said is the definition for corporatism, which is the proper term for fascism. So I've been warning that we were heading towards corporate fascism for 30 years. And uh, I think the people who are paying attention can see that we've arrived. So, um, yeah, that, that would be my main emphasis. So I tend, I tend to look at things in terms of uh, a global perspective, a historical perspective, look at it in terms of uh, political economy and also the underlying uh, culture. And then look also down at the philosophical roots of where we've gone wrong and how we correct that. So it's very broad and it's very deep. But I think uh, the essays that I write tend to crystallize uh, a lot of information in a very dense and accessible form. Very, uh, I mean, I think it was unconsciously influenced. If we say you, uh, you imitate those you love, well, my greatest literary hero was Henry David Thoreau, and he wrote in a very conversational style. And I found that really appealing, you know, a little interjection of very cutting wit, uh, you know, very frank, very plain spoken. And uh, that was really moving to me. So I think the essays and the writing in general are influenced by that. And I think they're also influenced by, without trying to imitate them, <clears throat> just the oratorical power. And the spiritual power of uh, somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. So the essays tend to have an oratory flavor to them. You know, they're conversational, but they, you know, they sometimes take on that flavor of uh, of an oratory. So it's trying to rouse the people, basically, out of what I would just frankly call a stupor. And I don't mean everybody. Obviously, there are lots of people who are highly alert, highly aware. But I think the majority of people. Are really are lost in a fog. So it's trying to shake them, rouse them. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty bracing writing and it pulls no punches, um, but ultimately certainly not bleak, you know, hopeful and right. uh, <clears throat> attempts to be inspiring and empowering. So there's an overview of, uh, of that. Well, uh, you and I actually have very similar histories because I as well studied philosophy in, in college with an emphasis on uh, political philosophy and political economy. So I'm looking forward nice. to this conversation because, you know, not, nice. not too many people like really enjoy discussing 18th and 19th <laughs> century political philosophy, <laughs> you know, as, as in depth yeah. as I like to go. So yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to really uh, delving in on that. I think one of the things well, what attracted me to your work initially was this concept of li left libertarianism. And I think, I mean, the interesting thing to me, actually, you bring up uh, Henry David Thoreau. He was a huge influence on me as well. I mean, when I was 16 and first read Thoreau, um, but I ended up going in a, in a very libertarian direction uh, in terms of the economics of it, like the free market economics. And initially, when I discovered anarchism, it was the kind of the Rothbardian uh, anarchism. Uh, although in college, I, I also read, uh, you know, w William Godwin, who's considered the founder uh, of uh, modern anarchy and kind of typically uh, lumped into the anarcho-capitalist camp. Um, and then as I got older, uh, I discovered other anarchists, the internet became more popular, of course, and we're starting to, to get together online. And all of a sudden, I find myself arguing with a lot of these uh, anarcho-communists. And I thought, you know, we're all anarchists. This is going to be a great party. And instead it was just this massive yeah. argument all the time. And it was like, what is going on here? Yeah. Uh, and I, I believe that you probably began your political philosophy studies more left-wing than I did. I, I'm not entirely sure about that. Maybe you could elucidate on that and then describe how, because, you know, over time, through all this sort of arguing with the anarcho-communists, I mean, I started to, tr I would try to be open-minded uh, and I incorporated as much of their views as possible and came to become more and more what I describe as left libertarian. So uh, maybe you could just describe your process, uh, what is left libertarianism and what was your process to get there? Um, I guess I would say I, um, I, I wasn't uh, at all political uh, in my 
up in uh, you know my teens, my childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't religious. It wasn't political. I you know it was just a uh, girls and parties. You know, <laughs> right? Um, Fair enough. But uh, I started to pay attention to things uh, when I was eighteen, and uh, you know, look, I watched the uh, liberal. Uh, in Canada, the, the big uh, dominant parties are the liberals and the conservatives. Liberals are paint themselves anyway as center left, um, the conservative center right. Um, anyway, to, to make it short, uh, you know, I, I just gravitated more towards. There was a sense of uh, of compassion, you mm -hmm. know, expressed in in the Liberal Party convention that you know we do we are our brothers' keepers sort of thing. So. You know, that's that's the common spirit on the left is that, yeah, you know, the Gospels, uh, and, you know, I'm not fundamentalist or anything. In fact, more Buddhist than anything else. But uh, um, taking that that maxim seriously, that we are a brother's keeper, that, you know, we um, but almost instantly became disillusioned with the Liberal Party, um, viewing it as being um, controlled by um, the party elite. You know, very, it's very similar to the Democratic Party. Um, and the two big parties in Canada, like the two big parties in the U.S., I mean, they are both, you know, beholden to corporate power. Right. You know, and transnational corporate power at that. It's not even, you know, they're not just beholden to Bay Street. That's our that's our Wall Street in Canada. No, they're not just beholden to the Canadian oil industry. No, they're beholden to international corporate powers. You know, um, so they don't offer much, in my view. Either the Democrats, the Republicans, or in Canada, the Liberals or Conservatives. And so I immediately gravitated towards the NDP in Canada, which is, you know, ever so moderately left. Right. And this was all within a really quick time. Went to an NDP convention, uh, supposed to be, you know, Social Democrat, uh, center left. And I listened to a veteran activist who I really respected um, uh, speak uh, as a member at the NDP convention in, uh, in my university town. And she was just, she just, she was scathing. She said, this party is neither democratic nor socialist. Mm. I, and that was it. You know, I thought, oh, okay, well, I'm out, <laughs> you know, not that I felt so strongly about socialism, but I did feel strongly about democracy. Uh, and then I got interest in the green party and that was a better fit for me. Uh, so the green party, you know, they, when I, you know, I became very active with them when they were, you know, pretty much, well, pretty much brand new to Canada. So environmental concerns, but also concerns, um, you know, broader concerns as well. And they like to say that we're neither right nor left, we're ahead. Uh, maybe that's a, a bit of a silly, you know, jingoistic caption, but they, they didn't want to be pigeonholed. They wanted to be open-minded and incorporate the best ideas they could find. And, um, but there was a strong within the Green Party in Canada, and I think internationally, you know, there are two polarities there. You know, one leans towards uh, statism and authoritarianism, although nobody would want to admit it. <laughs> yeah, right. And the other, and the other, you know, current. It's not like a, a faction or anything, but the other current in the Green Parties internationally, I would say. It's very libertarian. Hmm. Uh, I would say it's predominantly left libertarian, but you know it's a mix. You know, um, basically a view that uh, there's a spirit of anti-authoritarianism in the Green Party. You know, and wanting uh, grassroots, you know, radical direct uh, participatory democracy at the grassroots level. You know, that's that's very authoritarian. Uh, sorry, <laughs> very libertarian. And I'd say it's predominantly left libertarian, drawing on the left anarchist tradition. Uh, but it's but it was uh, eclectic, and, and it was consciously eclectic. You know, like trying trying to be a a, a big uh, a, a tent, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, so so there were people of um, um, you know uh, a li uh, libertarianism of the right within the Green Party as well. Anyway, so that's some of my background. Um, so yeah, I've I've associated myself, you know, basically since I started thinking about politics with the left, but always with a really strong libertarian um, orientation in that. You know, I'm def decidedly anti-authoritarian. Right. 
Um, and, and now recently, since 2020, I would say, I mean, the left has lost its mind. I just have to be frank about it. I mean, you know, all of the journals that I used to read, uh, well, almost all of them, all of the sources I used to go to, all of the organizations, all of the prominent figures, I mean, uh, they're either silent about the move towards, uh, you know, this blatant move towards authoritarianism, or they're cheering for it. So I, I'm, I was becoming a little disillusioned with the left, but now I'm just, I'm in shock and I'm appalled, you know, right. like, what happened to your minds, people? You know? Yeah. So the libertarian left is still out there, but what is called the left, it, you know, in Canada and the U.S., they're liberals, you know, and they're liberals who have always been ambivalent about power, in my view. And now that there's a shift towards authoritarianism, they've gone right along with it. So what's called the left, I would just call the faux left, you know. And the progressives, what are the progressives? You know, it's a name that is, to me, to I you know, I respect for progressives. You know, their hearts are in the right place, and they're often very alert and aware and well-informed. But um, what does that term really mean? I mean, is this liberals who don't want to use the word liberal? Or are they social democrats and they don't want to admit it? You know? Yeah. Uh, what are they? What are they? You know, it, it's, it needs to be defined. So the progressives and and the left, which you know, I would are and the liberals have gone into supporting, or at least silently condoning, a shift into authoritarianism. That's severely problematic. Now, where is the libertarian left in all of this? Uh, I mean, I can't be the only one on the continent, you know, or me and you. Like, right? There's got to be more of us. I, I think it's you know that because. Um, the liberals who and and the progressives uh, are, uh, I don't know, maybe they're more numerous or maybe they're just louder, you know. But we need to hear more from the libertarian left. The, and, and I've said before, and I would say again, that the real left, the thinking left, has always been libertarian. Broadly speaking, in the history of the left, <clears throat> you know, there were two currents, one with Proudhon, Godwin, Bakunin, Kropotkin, uh, Rudolf Rocker, Emma, Emma Goldman, Henry David Thoreau, uh, Murray Bookchin. This is all libertarian left. Uh, Marx um, <clears throat> led the other wing. Um, and Bakunin, in, you know, they, they used to be, uh, I don't want to say drinking buddies, but they were drinking buddies in Paris when they were young, and they would stay up all night long discussing politics and philosophy. And they were good friends. They knew each other really well. And it just so happened that later they became the two leading spokespersons in the first international, the first International Working Men's Association, which was a, a, a consciously socialist organization, but with two wings. The majority of the people supported the libertarian wing. That was the stronger, uh, more popular uh, view. And Bakunin was the main proponent. And he and Marx, Marx led the other wing. Uh, and Bakunin said of Marx that, um, and he knew him certainly better than anybody alive today. He knew, he knew him intimately as, as a friend, as a, as a colleague, somebody he debated with, you know. And uh, he said uh, his views are, and let, me, let me say, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent Bakunin, but he certainly challenged him directly on whether or not he was either leading the people on, on inadvertently into authoritarianism or he was a crypto authoritarian. Right. And, he, and he, so, yeah, he wrote a letter to, to Marx saying, and this is one of the key to breaking points between the authoritarian or status left and the libertarian left. Bakunin wrote this, wrote a letter to Marx and, and he said, I want you to clarify precisely what do you mean when you talk about the dictatorship of the proletariat? You know, when you mean the proletariat are going to form the government, what does that precisely mean? Surely you don't. If the proletariat means the working class. And re remember, this, these are terms that, you know, are not favored in, in North America. Um, but, you know, working class means the 99 percent, the people who don't live off their stock portfolios. You know, that's that's the vast majority of us. We're all working class. It doesn't matter what your income is. If you're not living off your stock portfolio, you're working class. Um, so Bakunin said, what do you mean? You're going to have all of the working class be part of the government, which means 99, you know, obviously you don't mean that. So what do you mean? And Marx, 
uh, I think it was revealing Marx's response. He didn't respond. I think that says a lot. Yeah. And Bakunin at the time, or right around that time, he predicted that if Marx or his followers did succeed in the revolution, they would create a tyranny worse than that of the czar. And it was chillingly accurate. You know, this is decades before the Russian Revolution. You know, whatever noble intents were there, uh, I think Bakunin and the libertarian left understand it better. They understand Lord Acton, Lord Acton's uh, famous statement. I don't know much about him until recently, but apparently he's uh, quite a brilliant historian. After all of his studies, he, you know, he made this famous statement. Uh, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. So the libertarian left understood that. And I think at the very least, you would have to say that Marx and his followers did not understand that. They thought, well, me and my friends were really smart and we're really good natured and we're really principled. So we're going to take total power in society. We're going to create a worker's paradise. And then we're just going to walk away from power. And the libertarian said, you're not going to walk away from power. If you take, if you seize that much power, it will corrupt you. Right. It's like the Lord of the Rings, you know, the one ring, it corrupts anyone who touches it. You, when you gather that much power in so few hands, it, it, it becomes corrupting. So that's, that's the big breaking point between um, the authoritarian left or which I, you know, if you want to say it in nicer terms, the elitist left, the vanguardist left. And not all Marxists hold this view, but it seems to be a weakness at, at the very least within the Marxist current. And the left libertarians are highly wary of, well, they're anti-authoritarian and they're highly wary of elitism, which leads inevitably to authoritarianism. So... Yeah, my sentiments, my gut feeling has always been. In fact, I just I'd forgotten that, but this is a little funny anecdote, which I think is relevant. My very first essay in philosophy um, yeah, <clears throat> was on uh, Plato's politi political philosophy, and uh, Plato came to despise democracy in Athens because the democratic uh, government of Athens sentenced his beloved teacher to death. And he couldn't forgive them. And he, he thought, you know, people like his teacher should be the rulers. So he came up with this concept of the philosopher kings. And my first instinct, not knowing anything about history at the time, for anything about political philosophy or anything about political economy, I didn't know, you know, jack shit about any of this. But my instinct was, that's dangerous. Yeah. And that that was the first essay I wrote. Now, after four decades and, you know, well over 50,000 hours of research, I would say history confirms that, that if, if you gather the power <clears throat> into the hands of a, of a small elite, um, that's extremely dangerous. And Thomas Jefferson agreed with that fully, right? He said, no, if, if you want a free uh, society and a peaceful society, a society that isn't uh, tyrannical, you need to decentralize power. So Jefferson was a Republican Democrat, definitely, decidedly of the libertarian inclination. So was Thomas Paine. So, yeah, <laughs> that's, a, <clears throat> that's a lot of <clears throat> thoughts in rapid succession there, but that, that's been my instinct since, you know, I first started thinking about this stuff and everything that I've studied and everything that I've read has just confirmed that, that um, elitism is an extremely dangerous attitude. Um, and we, our society keeps slipping back into it, especially in times of crisis, right? We want this strong, protective, paternalistic government is going to take care of us. And that's, very, that's a very dangerous time right, when that happens. And we're in the, exactly such a time right now. So that libertarian skepticism, you know, about elitism, um, that's really needed now. I, uh, so, I, 
Yeah, I mean, I just want to say I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that is a fundamental difference um, between, say, uh, your thinking and the libertarian left and um, uh, the more popular progressive movements or uh, the typical left that we see here in the United States in the Democratic Party. Uh, I find, well, I guess the first thing I wanted to say is that um, it is interesting because I definitely started, I mean, my my family was just Republican. And then I started looking into it and learning more about it, became libertarian uh, and then became anarchist. And it's funny that um, it was because of this idea of virtue on the left that the people on the right, quote unquote, uh, you know, didn't seem to have the compassion. They were individualistic. And that's what I get a lot. And the more that I looked into it, I really felt like I just didn't think that was true. I mean, certainly my own motivations were to be working for the good of the vast majority of the people, you know? <laughs> um, and then the more that I read and studied about left libertarianism, it, it just never even made sense to me that people are arguing about this stuff. Like if you live in a free society, where people can make individual choices, then why wouldn't people, you know, choose to form workers cooperatives or sustainable communities and, and do all of these other things? I mean, nobody uh, who identifies, quote unquote, as anarcho-capitalist had any kind of a problem with that. Um, and so it's, it's almost a, more about the way that you write or describe your perspectives in terms of, of how much compassion you have for your fellow humanity that attracts people um, more than maybe the more academic or intellectual arguments for for a free market. And now I just talk about uh, living in a free society, letting individuals make their own choices. And that's what's been so shocking for me in the last couple of years is watching many of my friends on the, on the political left really just start, I, I think that they conflate, and I this was probably done on purpose, but they conflate the idea of individual rights, which is fundamental to a liberal democracy. Uh, now people who believe in individual rights are being considered selfish. And then they seem to have this entirely naive perspective about this notion of power that you bring up. That, mm. you know, the people in power, the people in the government are there. I mean, most of my progressive friends now, they seem to think that, you know, this corporate government system really works great because if the corporations are left alone, it would just be horrible and a late stage capitalism. But as long as the government is there to regulate them, uh, then, you, you know, everything's good. And all the people in the government are always working for the people uh, in this good way uh, with complete compassion. And, and there's no corruption going on uh, in the system. And it just like boggles my mind. And I try to show them, well, it looks to me like, you know, there's corporate capture going on. There's this really mm -hmm. close relationship between corporations and government. I don't think either mm -hmm. one of them care about the people. They all seem to be working for the, the 1% or even the 0.1%. Yeah. Uh, the, the very wealthy have so much control over what the government does. People just won't see it. And then, and this, uh, this naive, feeling that the government is incorruptible or the the authority is incorruptible um coupled with um just a, a, a disbelief in individual freedoms because if the government argues hey this is good for the community they just want to say well this is what the government says is good for the community so everybody has to do it and if you don't do it you're a bad person and even if you're trying to say, well, the government is not correct on this, what the government, you know, is telling us to do is not good for this community. Uh, they'll just uh, continue to to kind of put you down. We're not even having logical arguments at this point or conversations or dialogue. Uh, a lot of times the conversation devolves into this shaming uh, or I mean, it's just become a, a, a totally uh, I almost think it feels like a, a radicalization of some of these people on the left. And the combination of those two things, the lack of understanding how power corrupts and the inability to really uh, respect individual boundaries against the power of government. I mean, this is what I see as fascism and this is what's happening yeah. all around us. I mean, and, and they're just, they're enabling it to happen. It's uh, It's been wild to watch. 
yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't know, I don't have strong enough words. I'm flabbergasted at the left, you know, <laughs> right. uh, people I respect and journals I respected organizations and groups I respected. And, uh, and yeah, they're, they're either silent or cheerleading for the so-called new normal of authoritarianism. Uh, I mean, wh- what happened here? Um, I mean, first of all, like we uh, talked earlier before we, um, you know, this is the, it strikes you as a complete ignorance of history. I mean, it's as if, uh, you know, not the rise of the Nazis and the rise of the Soviet Union never happened. You know, I mean, the, <laughs> uh, you know, as if we'd never had any experience in the world uh, with right. authoritarianism before that we have, you know, like we're babes going into this. It, it's, it's astounding to be either cheering for authoritarianism or, or silent about it, or complacent about it, uh, it shows a, a, a profound lack of any sense of uh, knowledge of history. You know, it's it's incredible, as well as like you say, uh, no understanding of um, the foundations of constitutional democracy. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, uh, there's so many points of discussion here. Um, Well, one For of the example, things. Go ahead. Um, it, you know, um, in terms of, uh, yeah, I don't want to get into it in too much because it's such a massive subject in itself. Uh, but in terms of the COVID crisis, I mean, the central question is not how do we assess the the genuine threat level of this virus, you know, and thinking people can find that out pretty quickly if they're interested in actual science. Um, and it's not how do we assess the uh, the safety or effectiveness of the vaccine? Those are important questions, but they're not the central question. The central question is, uh, do you believe that individuals have the right to sovereignty over their person, body, and mind? Yeah. Because if you do not, you need to understand the implications of that. And that means 800 years of constitutional law are thrown out the window going right back to the Magna Carta of 1215. Right. 1215, the Magna Carta set out that, you know, we have a, we have a basic, uh, you know, constitutional lawyers will, will phrase this differently than I would. I'm not a constitutional lawyer. But, you know, without a, a basic sovereignty over one's uh, person, body, and mind, uh, including the right to uh, choose one's own health care or refuse, you know, it's like, you know, if, if you don't have uh, sovereignty over that, you know, over, over your own body, then you have no rights right. at all. It's and, and slavery. That, that, that means, so it would mean, you know, if we go along with that, um, then, yeah, we have no constitutional rule. And constitution, the constitutional law is the founding law of any given nation. There are no laws. There's no rule by law without constitutional law. So if you're going to shatter uh, that right to sovereignty over one's one's own body, then there's no because that's the basis of constitutional law. Then there's no constitutional law, which means there's no rule of law, which means we're back to rule by decree, which puts us back, literally back to the dark ages, you know, eight hundred years ago. That's how serious this is. People don't right. understand yep. the gravity of this, or some people do, but the majority do not. We do. We want to have the government be able to do anything that it wants at any time. And the people have no rights whatsoever. Do we want, do we want rule of law abandoned? Because that, and then we have just rule by rules, which means rule by decree. The rules can change at a a whim at any time because there are no laws. Government just makes it up as they go along. You know, do we want to abandon the rule of law? Do we want to abandon the constitutional rule? And if we abandon those two things, we abandon all human rights and have the government be able to do whatever it wants. I mean, I, that is incredibly dangerous. It has really blown my mind to watch uh, friends of mine that ordinarily I would respect not take, when it came to COVID, not take this line of thinking to its logical conclusion that if you yeah. don't allow human sovereignty over their own body to make choices mm. for themselves, that's slavery. If we're continuing along this path, I mean, we've tossed, like you're talking about, we've tossed out the Magna Carta, no need for that. 
the constitutions and, and even the Nuremberg Code. I mean, these people, when I, would, so when I would bring it up to people at the beginning of the lockdowns and be like, hey, you know, this is thing what they're requiring, even with the mask wearing is actually going against the Nuremberg Code. And there's, you know, I'm trying to tell them, like, remember, there's a reason why they made this after World War II, you know, and they couldn't, yeah. they just couldn't see it. People would get offended when I'd bring it up, like, my God, you know, are you just looking for a fight? It's like, no, I, I'm just trying to point out that this is the logical extension of the way you're thinking right now. And if you, you know, you have to be willing to throw away these fundamental concepts of mm -hmm. individual rights that have saved us from feudal oppression over the course of the last 800 years that many, many people fought and died for yeah. uh, to preserve. And it's just like, then you can't even have the conversation. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not going there. They're not paying attention to that. It's as if this concept of, of setting a healthy boundary between your body, your person, and the power of the state has just gone up in flames. It's pointless. And people just say, you know, here in the US, Dr. Fauci says, and what he says must be what the science says. And he says, it's this is the best way for our community. And so you're anti-community if you don't disagree with Dr. Fauci, you know? And it's like, no, I'm not. Well, I'm try, you know, trying to tell them individual uh, sovereignty, individual rights is what's best for, for my community, you know? And let's not forget that. That's another um element that uh i think is really important for us to understand and i, I don't think it's um widely understood at all that <clears throat> every authoritarian um regime justifies itself on the basis of saying look this is for the greater good you know what the, what they're saying is we have a compassionate uh you know uh way Right. So shut up and do what you're told, you know, because we know it's best, uh, you know, <clears throat> um, you know, and and every one of these people, you know, uh, look, look at the embodiments of it: uh, <clears throat> Stalin, Lenin, Hitler, Mussolini, Chairman Mao. <clears throat> I mean, these all all these people thought they were the great benefactors of humankind. Mm -hmm. I mean, power is always self-rationalizing. That's one of its greatest dangers is that people become intoxicated with the power. It makes them feel special. It makes them feel important. It makes them feel that they uh, they can easily believe that they really do know better than other people, right? And it exactly. goes to their head. They become yeah. drunk with self deceit, and they start telling themselves they really are the ben you know they they really are the saviors of humanity. Right. I mean, Fauci and, said and last week he is science. He said, you know, people who disagree with, point. with me are disagreeing with science. It's like, how, how much hubris do you have to have to make a statement like that? Yeah. And um, I like uh, a lot of the things that uh, Gerald Salente said, world's leading trend analyst. He's brilliant. And I love that he's plain spoken. And I love that he's passionate. I mean, we should be passionate about these things. Yeah. We are allowing ourselves to be driven into uh, a very deeply authoritarian and that's putting it mildly to call it just authoritarian. We're being driven into an Orwellian gulag system. You know, I mean, we should be passionate about that. Um, yeah. So I was going to say uh, so so many thoughts and so much so many things to talk about at once. But yeah, the the idea that we must sacrifice uh, freedom for the sake of compassion is a lie. It is a, it is a lie <clears throat> and it is an illusion that people swallow. Now, this okay. is the big question in political philosophy is how do you balance the, 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 the individual and the collective, right? This is all, it's the great question. But if you do it by saying, well, we value a compassionate society and therefore we're going to just jettison freedom. Um, what goes along with that is respect for the individual. But think of it this way. If you say the individual is expendable, they don't have any rights. Well, then, you know, Hitler killed, not he, but the Nazis killed, you know, six million people in the death camps. 
But if each one of them are a nothing, that's six million nothings. Why should we care? You know, it's only a horror that six million people were killed by the last wave of fascism just in Germany. That Why is that an atrocity? Why is that a horror? Because every single individual matters. You know, so you can't go jettisoning the individual saying it's for the greater good, you know, yeah. because what is saying that human life doesn't matter. You know, you end up with a society that has no compassion, even though it's preaching compassion. Does that make you know what I mean? Yeah. So by 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 jettisoning the individual for the sake and uh if you jettison freedom for compassion, what you're doing is you're saying the individual doesn't count. And if the individual doesn't count, then human life has no value. Right. What are you being compassionate for in the first place? It's some <laughs> big abstraction. And you yeah. end up in atrocities that are rationalized for the greater good. You end up in genocide. This is such an important That's concept, it actually. And 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 it, it gets to the heart of this kind of left-right divide that we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation, because it does come back to to this idea of compassion or virtue uh, and people on the left are often attracted to being left wing because they, they self-identify as compassionate individuals. But as you say, because power corrupts and then power rationalizes itself, yes. of course, power is going to use compassion as a sure. rationalization for its existence, for its necessity. And so yeah. many people are just falling into this trap. And they, and it's almost as if, I mean, I think, of course, then you add a whopping heap of fear on top of uh, mm -hmm. people who already want to self-identify as compassionate and then rationalize the solution, uh, the, the compassionate solution is totalitarianism, you know, <laughs> and these people are willing to go along with it because they're already so frightened in the first place. They're, they're, they're triggered. They're not using their critical thinking skills as they otherwise might do. Um, and it's become a, a, a you know, it's turning into a pretty horrific issue where so many people uh, seem to be going along with this without even questioning. Just at, at the very beginning of the, I'll tell one quick story at the very yeah. beginning of the lockdowns here, you know, I had a friend, uh, she was kind of leaning more towards pro lockdown. She wanted to be safe. And I just said, you know, we're losing our right to freedom of assembly right now. It happened today. And yeah. that's important. And I think we should have a conversation about it. I didn't say, you know, I disagree with the lockdowns. You know, there's no way I'm even listening to this point of view. I'm just saying, why aren't we even, uh, you know, recognizing, comprehending, having a debate yeah. about losing this important freedom just because yeah. everybody was so scared of the virus? Uh, yeah, it, it shut down, shuts down uh, protests pretty effectively. Yeah. Um, in terms of psychology, uh, that's where I was going with uh, mentioning Gerald Salente. I mean, uh, he put it pretty uh, pointedly in terms of um, in terms of the the billionaire class. He, you know, he's you know, mess with them, have dinner with them. No, you know, analyzes their their actions as well as their rhetoric, and he said, oh, "Look, they're, they're egomaniacs." You know, so so that's the one percent of the one percent, the point one percent who have gotten their claws into all, virtually all the governments of the world. Right. I mean, it's, it's the Davos uh, billionaires who are setting this agenda um, in terms of the, the, not just slide, but, you know, the, us being driven into authoritarianism and uh, yeah, it's, it's egomania and it's, and it's power lust. Um, and in terms of the, the mass psychology um, a part of it, a large part of it, again, Salente, I think, was right. And, and he nailed it. He said, uh, the people have lost their confidence. You know, that's why they don't they don't stand up for themselves. They don't stand up for one another. Right. Um, they they uh, kowtow <clears throat> uh, uh, to the ruling elites or go along with them um, because there's a there's a lack of a loss of confidence among the people. So you've got egomania and power lost. <laughs> and the, the ruling elite and you've got um you've got a, a large i'd say the majority of people who yeah i mean that's that's a one of the big uh parts of the problems is is a loss of confidence like, um, there's a loss of self-dignity and a loss of self-confidence otherwise we would be mm -hmm. saying we would be questioning a lot more i mean people a lot more people would be questioning a lot more
Well, it's fascinating. You even hear in the in what I consider to be the propaganda is all of this. Listen to the experts. Listen to the experts. You know, don't yeah. think for yourself. Don't think for yourself. Yeah. You can't understand this complicated stuff. So listen to the experts. Yeah. And so people are actually ingrained with this concept that they they really can't understand it and they have to listen to the Dr. Fauci's of the world and just be told what to do because they're not an expert rather than being taught that we're all individuals, we have critical thinking capacities and we should be cultivating our own critical thinking skills rather than just listening to, you know, whoever's on the TV screen <laughs> at the moment or yeah. whoever's at the top of the political hierarchy, the authority, the authoritarian hierarchy, right? Um, so it's challenging. I mean, we, I talked a little bit about b- before when we were on the phone about the difference between sophistry, which I think we've been touching on, uh, with these authoritarians who are good at rationalizing their authoritarianism versus critical thinking. This goes back to the Socratic dialogues. He was always right. talking about, he was trying to cultivate critical thinking, mm-hmm. pointing out how the sophists, uh, you know, were just, they could string complicated sentences together and they could sound smart, but they were missing the mark. Uh, and they were just justifying uh, tyranny or exhibiting hubris. They were arrogant about their ability to, to lodge. They were the experts of their day. Right? And they got a, the sophist in uh, ancient Greece, they got a very bad reputation because they got the reputation that of being utterly deceitful and mercenary. Yeah. Um, that they would, uh, they would argue for any position uh, so long as it paid well. I mean, they were intellectual prostitutes was the basically precisely accusation. And uh, do we see that today? Uh, it's it's still rampant. Yeah, you know, it's, it's still it's rampant. It's taken over, right? I would say it's taken over the whole system. Uh, you know, well, that's, in, that's, in the CDC that's the and the FDA. Yeah, yeah. Who so are these guys? Yeah, that's the mainstream media. That's the corporate media. That's the state media, the government media in Canada with the CBC. Uh, you know, they do a lovely job on sports and entertainment, but you know, you don't, you don't watch them for the news. My God, <laughs> it's like, I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's MSNBC, it's Fox, it's CNN, it's uh, Washington post, uh, New York times. I mean, um, these are, these are either corporate controlled or government controlled, um, media and, uh, they're ruled, uh, by the same elite. I mean, six corporations now control 80% of the major media in the world. Right. And, and in terms of BBC and CBC, Britain and Canada, these are state controlled media. But now who has who has who holds the purse strings for, you know, who, who has the financial leverage to blackmail any virtually any government into submission? Well, that's that's the transnational uh, billionaire class. Yeah. So we've we've got a we've got elite in sociology. They call it institutional capture. So the business elite, the corporate elite, there is a small group of people, you know, it's a 1000 CEOs who command the, the 1000 biggest corporations on the planet. Um, they're the members of uh, Davos World Economic Forum, along with the 1000 richest individuals in the world, the rest by invitation. So they've got they've institutionally captured the mass, the tools of mass communication. Thankfully, there's shows like yours and, you know, a few other you know, good uh, media outlets, but the major media are taken over by that same 0.1%. Yeah. We've taken over the economy, Swiss systems analysis, you know, uh, a few years ago came out, did an analysis of the global economy and said, look, you know, we can, we can show by systems analysis, 40 corporations effectively rule the global economy, most of them banks. So yeah, the, the sophistry, uh, you know that that's the norm, and um, so you know indoctrination, therefore, and propaganda is is the norm. Exactly. That, in, in if that's the norm, you know people really need to, uh, like Chomsky said, take an intellectual take a course in, in, in intellectual self defense. Learn how to think critically and question authority above all. I mean, that's just it, right? The opposite of of personal critical thinking skills is just participating in a system of indoctrination and propaganda. And that's what people are willing to, I mean, I don't, I I think honestly, 
we've been prepared for this for a long time. I mean, the, the public education systems, which were also set up by a lot of these same wealthy foundations that are promoting the, the pharma, pharmaceutical conven- uh, solutions right now, um, are the very same people that helped set up these public education systems that have over time really reduced any kind of study of critical thinking and actually ingrained into people this follow the authority indoctrination type of pedagogy. And now people just aren't in the habit of, of standing up for themselves and feeling confident about their own opinions and even being able to really uh, rationally form their own opinions because they've never been taught how to do it. It makes it so easy uh, to just capture them uh, in this propaganda web. And so frustrating to try to, to argue about it. I, I wanted to dive a little deeper into the psychological aspects of all of this precisely because of this. I mean, I personally, I think you have as well. It's frustrating to engage because once people are caught in the indoctrination propaganda web there and their critical thinking is shut off, especially if they feel like they're in a state of emergency or in a state of fear, uh, then you're not, it, it's not, you're not talking about critical thinking anymore. And, and I, for one, got, I'm tired of arguing with people about my personal healthcare choices or my personal education. I mean, these personal life choices, you got to go on social media now, spend all day like, well, ivermectin, this peer reviewed study says this, you know, or whatever, instead of just going like, well, this, if I get sick, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm, I'm happy to let you do what you want to do. Um, but I wanted to kind of get into this bigger picture of the psychology of it all um, through your essay on narcissism and independence, because uh, I've been going in the same direction as well towards wondering, like, critical thinking is not happening here. We're not having dialogue. We're not having debate. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of people who appear to be indoctrinated by a propaganda system. What's going on? So we get into the realm of psychology. And then from this lens, frankly, a lot of stuff started to make sense to me that previously uh, I couldn't understand what was going on. So do you want to describe maybe the inspiration uh, and some of the ideas within that essay on narcissism? Uh, that's a lot to uh, convey uh, sure. in a concise way. Let me see. Uh, I think a lot of things have been driving us um, in uh, <clears throat> the modern industrial world uh, towards a uh, a narcissistic state. Um, I think, I mean, where do you begin with that? Um, well, like, uh, I think you, over, I think overvaluing, overvaluing materialism, consumerism. I mean, it's not that we have to, you know, um, live in a mud hut and, you know, and be utter, utterly austere or Spartan about it, but we went hog wild <clears throat> with materialism and consumerism. And I think that that does drive towards, uh, narcissism and it also <clears throat> also what it does is it drives towards a, a breakdown of human relationships uh and a breakdown when you overvalue um material uh place an excessive value on material things and cons- consumption consumerism entertainment um, you become disconnected also from your own inner life. So there's a, there's a multifold alienation that's going on there. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I came across, I think it was in, in my 20s, reading a philosophy magazine. There was an article by a, a, a Jesuit priest. It, it source kind of surprised me, but um, it was extremely thoughtful, and I thought it really nailed it. He said that the root problem of the modern world is that there's a threefold alienation. So we're alienated from <clears throat> one another, we're alienated from nature, and we're alienated from our, our deeper selves. And to, to that, I would add a fourth that we're, uh, you know, uh, and this is um, a drawing on, um, on Marx. Uh, Marx, I'd say, I would say, is a brilliant sociologist, has a tremendous amount to, to offer, um, but a terrible philosopher and a dangerously naive political philosopher. But uh, his idea that we're alienated from our own labor and we're alienated from our own creative power. So there's a fourfold alienation that, that is underway in modern society for a number of drivers. But materialism, consumerism, and um, addiction to entertainment. Not that, mm. again, not that entertainment is bad, but, you know, all things in moderation, like the ancient Greeks said. So we went overboard on materialism, consumerism, entertainment addiction. And 
what it did, I think it it deep it created or or aggravated um, an alienation between uh, ourselves and others, ourselves and nature, uh, and alienation from our deeper selves, and an alienation from our own um, labor and creative power. And so that leaves this uh, kind of inner hunger and dissatisfaction. You know, it makes me think of T.S. Eliot, The Hollow Man. Um, and yet, and and out of that hunger that that comes out of the alienation, um, you get more insatiable desire. So that fuels further the materialism, the consumerism, the entertainment addiction, and it's a downward spiral. So where it's where it's leading, and I think where it's taken a lot of people. I don't know, what, you know, I'm not a <clears throat> sociologist, although I've studied a lot and thought a lot about it. I couldn't give a, a percentage, but a very large percentage, I don't know if it's 40%, 70% of the people are on that trajectory somewhere heading down into the, <clears throat> down in the spiral of what I'd call a mass narcissistic rege- uh, regression mm-hmm. to an infantile state. Mm-hmm. So you, you go down, 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 um, and it's this inner screaming for, you know, some sense of satisfaction or fulfillment. You know, which and 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 the response is to reach out to to materialism, to consumerism, to addictions, to uh, entertainment, constant entertainment, constant stimulation. And these things never satisfy that need. So the, it becomes more and more desperate. Um, but yeah, it, it 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 the the narcissistic regression. It's you know it's a regression. Um, which does produce an infantile state. Uh, and, and that obviously that's not good for critical thinking. Right. You know, so yeah. we've got some really deep seated problems in modern society and we have to address them at a deep level. We, you know, we can't just keep putting bandages on them. That that doesn't work, you know? Um, so that's part of the part of the picture, you know. You've got people who I, I really think that um, a large percentage, whether it's forty percent, whether it's seventy percent, I don't know, somewhere in between, they don't have any values anymore. You know, I, I don't believe they have any values anymore. They profess values. They think they have values. They tell themselves they have values, whatever they may be. You know. Um, you know, I, I'm a Christian. I'm a I'm a this. I'm a that. You know, I'm a I'm a Buddhist. I'm a progressive. I'm a, I'm a spiritual person. I, you know, profess all these things, um, but really they they've come down to having one value, and that is their own comfort. Right. The only thing that will really stand up for is, if that at all, the, everything else is can be sacrificed because. They've been driven into a nihilistic, narcissistic regression to an infantile state where the only thing they value is their comfort. Right. So do whatever you want where, you know, you can uh, deport half the population or you know, you can you can do right. anything you want as long as I personally feel relatively comfortable and uh, give me lots of entertainment, you know, because that helps with my comfort as well. You know, and, and they've, they've lost, I think their confidence, their dignity, their sense of empowerment, their ability to critically to think critically or even to think rationally. Uh, and they don't want to think. They don't want to think. And, and I'm not talking with everybody, obviously, but a large portion, you know, whatever so whatever it is, 40 to 70 percent. <clears throat> it's a nihilistic, narcissistic, infantile state to various depths and degrees in different people. Um, but yeah, um, they want to. They want the government to take care of them, uh, and uh, they don't want to be troubled with thinking or making any decisions. Um, just you know, other people think for them, and don't trouble. You know, they don't want to have any responsibility for having to make up their own, form their own views, you know, or come to a decision on something. Right. So it. 
It's a sad state of affairs. <laughs> we find uh, we're ourselves gonna have to sh- in. We're going to have to shift us to, <laughs> to, to uh, positive things. Uh, um, yeah, I wanted to, well, I mean, I, I just want to um, kind of drive home that point about that state of infantilism. Uh, I think exactly what you're saying is right, that people have been basically so alienated from their own individuality, from their own personal you know, from a young age, we're, we're taught to do what we're told. We're taught to learn what we're told to learn. We're not allowed to just follow our own creative impulses and, and um, you know, follow our own passions. And uh, everybody kind of just gets shuffled in until you're just a cog in this economic wheel, you know, this mm-hmm. economic machine. And uh, the only solace is basically a big pile of addictions. You can go home, you can drink some beers, you can watch your favorite TV show and numb your brain until you go back to work again and, uh, and just to pay the bills. And this whole lifestyle basically starts to prevent people from using their own critical thinking, being confident in their own emotions. Uh, and even as you say, then avoiding even wanting to wake up to the horribleness of your situation. I noticed in one of your recent articles, you know, you discussed the matrix, waking up out of this matrix and and finding out that, you know, the real world is actually uh, pretty ugly. And and we see that uh, so few people, I think it's just another psychological form of avoidance. They just don't want to see it. They can't imagine that a Dr. Fauci could be corrupted by the power that he has, because if they did, They'd, it would just open up this whole can of worms that would be too horrible. I mean, they'd have to come to recognize their own narcissistic infantile behaviors, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and complicity and complicity yeah. as well. Yeah. So, um, I, I want to add that uh, the world is beautiful. The world is magical and beautiful, but our present social reality, that's getting very dark, you know, right. Um, so, I mean, nature is, I think, uh, magical and beautiful and we can have a a society, um, that is also beautiful. Um, but our current society, yeah, that's, that's, that's looking very dark for sure. Will you talk a little bit about this, uh, the 30%, 40%, 30% rule that you've written about in terms of, of how people can, can be manipulated. And then I definitely, uh, do want to wrap up the last 20 minutes or so, uh, on a more positive note, talking about some solutions, but I just, Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the way that you break this down, how easily it is to convince, if you can convince just a portion of the population that you're right, Mm -hmm. then the population itself basically starts to like, uh, build its own prison, right? I mean, all they have yeah. to do with the indoctrination, with the propaganda is convince a certain percentage. And then it's like, most people will go along because they don't want to argue or deal with, uh, those that are like true believers. Yeah. Um, I, w- I would say back up from that just a bit though. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when, when Occupy Wall Street, uh, broke out, that was a big learning experience for, I think, uh, for the, for the whole Western world and for the world. And it was a big um, learning experience in terms of start people, more people starting to understand that, uh, yeah, we have had institutional capture uh, in terms of uh, governments, media, financial system, the economy, um, increasingly uh, schools, uh, universities, uh, even science, the scientific journals. So corporate capture, um, has taken place Mm -hmm. um that's the big that's the giant elephant in the middle of the room that you know gets avoided i mean when you deal with that obvious should be obvious reality um then um the fact that a crisis is used to increase the power of the already powerful you know should not you know shouldn't surprise anybody Right. right i mean what are the what, it's what, amazing. what else would you expect right it's amazing how many people blow that notion off as conspiracy theory when it's like of course they're going to use they've been using these they've been using crises to grab power again like you were talking about if you're a student of history it's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years it's the way it's, it's the way to grab power to rationalize 
uh, a power grab using an emergency. <coughs> um, you'd think it'd be part, obvious. Part of part of it is uh, like we discussed when we were talking on the phone. Um, most people, the vast majority of people, are not sociopaths. You know, ninety nine percent of the people are not sociopaths. Right. You know, some people are frankly assholes. <laughs> uh, so some people are are pretty damn ruthless. You know, pretty callous. Yeah. Uh, but you know, whatever, wherever uh, the, the the leading uh, researcher in terms of that, uh, he came up with it with a test to uh, screen for sociopaths, and he found that people fall somewhere on a spectrum, right? You've got less than one percent who are, you know, who call them saintly, you know, at the other extreme, there's roughly 1% who are sociopaths, the vast mm-hmm. majority of people fall somewhere in between there, right? We do have, um, it, it's been confirmed. Um, uh, Kropotkin wrote about it in Mutual Aid that we have an, inst- we have a, so uh, we are one of the social animals that mutual aid is instinctive and natural to human beings. Uh, and now it's been confirmed that uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Rifkin has written about it in uh, The Empathic Civilization. We're hardwired for empathy. You know, which is part of our social uh, nature. You know, we are social creatures. Um, sociopaths have managed to suppress and bury their natural human empathy and compassion. Um, and what people have difficulty accepting or fathoming is that there really are uh, evil people in the world. I mean, there are people who are just, they're not sadists. Sadists, you know, enjoy inflicting suffering. Sociopaths, they, it's not that they enjoy uh, suffering. They just, they're indifferent to it. Yeah. You know, a, a million dead, it means, it, it means literally nothing to them. They just have, they're reptilian. I mean, they're just cold. They have buried their natural human sympathy, empathy, compassion. And what happens when you have a society such as ours, which is built around hierarchical power structures, concentrations great concentrations of power well sociopaths are naturally attracted to that they always go to where the power is right so you know it should not be surprising you know from it on that that level right and uh, so we've got we've got eight uh the richest eight uh individuals on the planet this is from um oxfam's uh davos report on global inequality richest eight individuals on the planet now control more wealth than the poorest half of humanity. Now, if that's not vast power, what is, you know, in 2019, um, by 2019, the three richest men in the United States, uh, which was uh, Bezos, uh, Gates and Buffett had more wealth than the poorest half of Americans. Those you, statistics you can, are so amazing to me when you see, it's just like, oh my God, the wealth inequality. <laughs> anyway, yeah. people should be in the streets about that alone. Yeah. So when, when there's that much vast power concentrated in a very few hands, you know, and remember, uh, so, you, um, and, and the, the, the banking, uh, cartel is, is a part of that. They're the, the pinnacle there. Um, these are the people who control the purse strings for the big, for for even the richest governments. The, yeah. the U.S. government, the Canadian government, the British government, the European governments. I mean, they're controlling the purse strings. So the corporations have effectively taken over. Um, you know, uh, what? You know, why would it be surprising that therefore that they use a crisis to increase their wealth? and their power. If you are listening to this, you are listening to the first free hour of The Shift with Doug McKinty. For access to the full feature-length versions of the podcast, go to www.theshiftnow.com and subscribe for the audio version for just $6 a month. Access the full-length episodes in video form through rockfin.com by subscribing at the Shift with Doug McKinty landing page. For $9.99 a month, you gain access not only to The Shift, but also all other premium content material hosted on the platform. Find out more at www.theshiftnow.com backslash store. Detoxify your body, decolonize your mind, make the shift. Well, I've, I've kept you for almost two hours now. I want to spend (laughs) maybe, yeah. Um, We're just getting into it so, so much. And there's so much to delve into here in terms of, 
I, I mean, you know, honestly, it's so funny in talking to you. It's like so much of this is so obvious when you have the eyes to see, but but then, you know, clearly there's a certain percentage of the population that's not seeing it. Um, and that's the, the frustrating aspect of all of this. But I, I love that you call out, you know, call the spade a spade, talk about the fact that fascism is on the rise. Um, and what a clear and present danger it really is. Again, if your eyes are open, if you're seeing what's really going on, if you're if you understand uh, the power struggles that are happening and, and uh, that these uh, upper classes are clearly winning that power struggle right now, unless more people figure it out. Um, but I would like if you'll if you'll give me a few more minutes of your time, I do want to finish up on uh, on a positive note. And I want to talk about a little bit about solutions before I let you go in terms of of what left libertarianism has to offer, how it can be a big tent for people and, and what exactly uh, are the solutions um, that are presented in, in, in the left libertarian universe uh, that you know, that can lead us out of this crazy authoritarian uh, situation that we're right on the cusp of, of really falling deeply into? Um, I would say that um, modern democracy was founded with a, an ambiguous and uh, imperfect understanding of power relations. And that has been source of Mm -hmm. enormous troubles that is the root in part uh, of of the rise of fascism which is happening right now and people need to get with the program meaning i mean they need to get their heads together uh, and and understand what's happening and don't take my word for it don't take anybody's word for it do your own research look at the evidence look at the documents look at the statements um the documents the writings uh by the business elite by the political elite by the military industrial complex um, so yeah, when modern democracy was formed, um, certain powers were questioned, other powers were not. Right. Right. So we questioned, you know, should the king have so much power? We questioned, should the aristocracy have so much power? We questioned, should the church have so much power? And we set up, uh, you know, first, uh, the first modern democracy, on a national national level, on a you know vast scale, the U.S. and you know people might forget how beautiful and glorious and magnificently important that is and was and is. Um, but it did not. It, so it put they put um, checks and balances on political power. You know, and limits on political power. So the government can only have so many, so much power under um, under the U.S. Uh, system and constitution of constitutional democracy. Um, and they made a separation of church and state. So that means that protects the churches from being taken over by the government. It's protection for the churches and the religions. Protection, protection for religious freedom. And it's also protection from the churches taking over the government works both ways so separation of church and state yeah. and limitations on the powers of the state and the government well that's all very sensible and very good but it was incomplete it was incomplete um the uh economic power was not questioned you know and, and that's understandable because you know the framers were among the the upper classes frankly you know they're they're among the uh, associated or aligned with um, economic privilege. Yeah. So anyway, because economic power was not questioned, we allowed economic power to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. I mean, you you can say I, I'm not a Marxist, but I mean, Marx did point out some things as a sociologist that are just flatly true. One right. is that the more money you have, the faster you can make money. <laughs> In a market economy, money tends to concentrate and concentrate and concentrate. Now, you, you, you can say you want a uh, 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 laissez-faire uh, capitalist economy and you want freedom, but unless you put limits on concentrations of economic power, 
that power will crush your freedom eventually. And that's what the libertarians of the right fail to recognize. Yeah, if, you, yeah. if you have a laissez-faire uh, market economy, you know, the first, all the business people say it, the first million dollars is the hardest, right? And then it comes faster and faster and faster and faster. It snowballs, right? Um, it's, it's exponential, in fact. Um, so if you just leave that alone, it's going to, that your, your liberal democracy, which is what the U.S. started as, a liberal democracy, right? We've got political freedom, we've got uh, constitutional democracy as our political system, and we've got uh, a basically laissez-faire capitalist uh, economy. Well, that's all well and good at, at the start until that economic power starts to concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. Uh, and even by 1812, 1812, I mean, this is shortly after the American Revolution, Thomas Jefferson wrote, and I, and I love this quote because it summarizes it, summarizes it all. This is what went wrong over the last 200 and some years since the American Revolution. This is what went wrong. He said in 1812, over 200 years ago, I pray we shall crush the moneyed aristocracy in its infancy. For already it bids defiance to our laws and seeks a contest of strength with our democratic government. So checks and balances and limits were put on political power, but not on economic power. And even by 1812, the business elite were starting to tr try to take over and uh, strangle, or at least control, the democratic government. We ignore Jefferson's warning. 200 years, some years have gone by, and the business elite have taken over. Yeah, we no longer have democracy. We live in an oligarchy. In fact, it's now it's not even national national. Now it's a global oligarchy. Right. So the libertarian I, sentiment of wanting to limit power is correct. It's sensible. We just did not apply it consistently enough. Right. So here's the difference between right libertarianism and left libertarianism. Right libertarianism. Just like the founders, they, they, they are highly wary of excessive powers in the state or the government, rightfully so. But they're oblivious to even greater powers in terms of economic power. We, you can't ignore the one, right? So the yeah. Marxist Leninists, they say, oh, oh, you know, great power in the state, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But what we want to crush is the power of, of the business elite. So they're the mirror image of one another. Right. The libertarians of the right are the mirror image of the Marxist Leninists. Hmm. Now, that'd I, be, that's a horrifying conception. But you, if, I, you, if you don't challenge economic power, it will swallow your freedom. That's the lesson we need to learn now, which means left libertarianism is the answer to the oversight that was made in 1776. They failed to put checks and balances and limits on just how much of an empire, financial empire, can one person create without it threatening the democracy itself. Yeah. I mean, how much economic power do you think any one person would be able to uh, amass without being able without access to government power though i mean that's what i think i think that without i mean the government creates the corporations they they fund the corporations with massive government contracts you know without government uh or with a highly highly decentralized government i don't think well, corporate power would would be allowed to exist i i think it it's becomes a, it becomes almost a theoretical uh moot point at this point mm -hmm. The rea current reality is we have hyper concentrated. We have allowed economic power to be hyper concentrated. Sure. It's now mon global monopoly capitalism. You know, so we started out with liberal democracy and laissez-faire capitalism. It rapidly became crony capitalism. By um, 1970s, it was moving into neoliberalism, neoconservatism. Yeah. You know, 
And we're starting to see the merger of the business and the state. So we now have a corporate oligarchy that we can't pretend doesn't exist. Yeah. You have to deal with that. Which, you know, and I also see all of that as just an extension of colonialism. I mean, I, you know, I was thinking about this before our conversation that even like in Adam Smith's arguments about laissez-faire, you know, he was worried about the power of the mercantilists who were yeah. basically the guys that were working for the East India Company, right? Which was the first transnational corporation or one of the first transnational corporations. And these guys are all, you know, they're they're participating in imperialism, yeah. basically corporate imperialism. And that, I think has just continued to grow. I mean, there was a revolution, but as you say, in the United States, there was a revolution, but they didn't kick the East India Company out, right? They just kicked out the British military and they're still doing business with these same guys uh, that I think eventually just those guys eventually were able to take over the government again through more subversive economic means, as you say, not not overtly militarily. Um they didn't but, have to take it over militarily. Exactly. They still right. got what they wanted. You control the purse strings. Yeah. You, you don't need the guns, right? Yeah. You you take over the people with the guns, the state, right? With your money power. And John Thomas Jefferson saw that in 1812. Yeah. And nobody listened. So yes, at this point, um, um and, and cer- certainly um the business elite, um, they don't want the state eliminated. What they want is to control the state. It's a powerful tool at their disposal. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I think is, I think it's actually really interesting that uh, people see this sort of distinction between the state and and corporate power. I mean, to me, it's just one and the same. They're the same. They have merged. They're the same entities. They, uh, They have the same goal, which is corporate imperialism it's an empire they're building an empire they're controlling exactly. resources all over the world it's transnational now um yeah and so the power of the state is is the corporate power which it goes back to that whole marxist leninist thing they thought they could have a powerful state without having a a powerful elite uh, you know <laughs> like sorry it's that's it's one and the same no matter how they organize it and and they happen to prefer to organize it with corporations because I think they can keep things more secret. They don't so, have those pesky constitutions to deal with if if they can do most of their business with within the corporate world, you know. Um so the libertarians of the right uh um I'm not as familiar with, but um there is I mean a clear um call for laissez faire unregulated laissez faire capitalism with um, a, a state or government which is very shrunken or eliminated, mm-hmm. but you know, um, up until up until 2020, uh, you know, I, I keep referring to him because uh, Ch- Chomsky was one of the best analysts in terms of uh, political economy. Doesn't matter what he's associated with; he was associated with the libertarian left, uh, and I think very genuinely. I mean, he was just consistent. Uh, uh, remarkably so for 60 years. Um, and he said, look, the, the libertarians on the right, what they fail to realize is that if you simply eliminate the government uh, without doing anything about corporate power, mm-hmm. uh, what are you going to have? You're not going to have freedom, A. And B, uh, you're not going to have democracy. Um, C, you're, not also, you're also not going to have a free market. You're going to have straight corporate rule. It's going to be a corporate oligarchy. It'll be a, a corporate empire, and you know the government is at least potentially some some restraint on uh, on the corporate powers. Yeah. So I I I really think as myself for myself, I wouldn't call myself an anarchist. I would call myself, uh, you know, along with Thomas Paine. I mean, uh, um a left libertarian uh democratic republican uh i would say there's a role for the for the government there's a role for a democratic government um but the first thing we need to do is uh to reclaim our democracy the people need to reclaim their democracies their national democracies certainly not on a global scale on a national democracy we need to reclaim our democracies we need to kick money out of the political process um, which means we're going to need to dethrone the corporate oligarchy. And we're gonna, I've written extensively on various ways we can do this. 
what needs to be done. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not anti-business. I've run three businesses. Um, but uh, I, I'm opposed to oligarchy. I'm opposed to empire. I'm mm-hmm. opposed to uh, corporate elite taking over our government and gutting our constitutions and our rights and our freedoms. I'm opposed to that for sure. So I, I think rather than, uh, you know, 500 years from now or maybe 50 years from now, maybe maybe we've defeated the corporate fascists. We've reclaimed our national democracies. And at that point, we can say, OK, let's decentralize power. You know, I like Thomas Jefferson's view um, that the federal government should have the least amount of power. The local government should have the most power. Yeah. Most decisions should be local decisions, town hall democracy. And then the state, the counties have have some power. The states have some power. The federal government, the national governments have the least power. We've got it upside down, decentralized power. But first things first, first, we need to recapture, reclaim our democracy so that we can reclaim our constitutional human rights and we can dethrone the corporate oligarchs. I yeah. think we, we have to do it in that order, is my view, my strong view. I think if we do it the other way around, first of all, nobody's going to support it. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. I mean, the elite don't want it. They want they don't want to dismantle the state. The state's their tool. The elite don't want it. And the great majority of people don't support libertarians of the right. They don't want to dismantle the state. So it's a non sequitur to begin with. It's purely theoretical. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Generally speaking. You know, maybe some places it'll happen. Generally speaking, it's not going to happen. So why are we talking about it? Well, I do. Let's let's say I agree with Thoreau. Right. He said. "Um, I heartily agree with that motto. That government is best, which governs the least. And I would like to see it acted up to more readily and more fully and acted out. It finally amounts to this. That government is best, which governs not at all. And when men are prepared for it. That is the kind of government they shall have. And then he went on to say, but I do not count myself among the no government men. I do not call for at once no government, but at once a better government. Let every man state what kind of government we command his respect, though, we shall be one step towards attaining it. I think that's very practical. So he's separated the long-term ideal. The long-term ideal is where we as human beings have reached a level of maturity where we don't need a government to tell us how to live. We, we just don't need it anymore. Um, but I think that's in the future. I don't think we're, you know, maybe that's 30 years from now. I doubt it. Maybe it's 300, maybe it's 3000. I think in the future we'll come to a time where, you know, we help each other because we want to help each other because, you know, it's a kind thing to do. And it's also mutually beneficial. Right. We all benefit when we help each other. So that's the left libertarian long term view in the immediate. you got to defeat the fascists. Right. I hear that. That's the immediate thing. Right. So separate the long term ideal from the immediate practicality, which both Chomsky and Thoreau uh, did very well. Yeah. I mean, you know, the thesis in The Wealth of Nations was that if you have a free society, then people become more virtuous because when they're given that responsibility of taking care of themselves and others, they actually step up and they do that. And if you don't, if you have this uh, large government controlled by these, you know, mercantile or corporate interests um, that are very controlling of people and don't give them that that moral responsibility for themselves, then they become less virtuous, I think, ultimately descending into exactly what we were talking about before this level of like narcissistic infantilism, where they, they, they really can't take care of themselves. So I think the more we decentralize power, uh, and allow individuals to have that personal responsibility for taking care of themselves and their families and their communities, then we'll actually start to grow more virtuous people. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that's the direction we want to be heading in like decentralizing power and giving people the power back to make personal choices for themselves. And then I think a lot of people might be surprised that, that people, you know, will step it up. We'll do, we'll make the the right choices. It's not, it kind of goes back to that whole, uh, the argument that we didn't really get a chance to talk about it, but your, your article about Hobbes, where the notion is that human nature is just horrible and people would be you know, killing each other and and competing with each other in this terrible world without the government to, to rein them in. Uh, Instead, it's, it's actually the opposite. The government is, 
is the, um, you know, the negative impulse, the corrupting influence. That's what, where these sociopaths and, and psychopaths go to have power over people. It's actually attracts the bad people into these power structures, the hierarchical structures. And then the more control we let them have, the weaker we become, you know, the weaker the people become over time. Um, so I'm right yeah, there with you on the on decentralizing power, I think is, is the way forward. And I think the more we can do that and, and then the, the stronger and stronger the people will become that we'll have we'll, more and more capable of taking care of themselves. You know, I think when you have a, when you have a, a, a society based in, in a hierarchy um, uh, and, uh, or, uh, or as we're going into now, again, an authoritarian society, um, the elites treat the people as children. And when people are treated yeah. as children, lo and behold, they, they, they learn to behave as children. Yeah. So that doesn't, you know, that, that doesn't go in a good direction. Now, that's aside from atrocities and abuses of power, which also are inevitable. You know, you end up with a, with a, a, a bunch of very uh, discontent, unhappy, glum uh, you know, servile, uh, infantilized, uh, people. I mean, that's, that's not a, that's not a happy society, <laughs> you know? Um, Absolutely. All right, Todd. Yeah. I probably should let you go. I bet we could talk for, for another hour if we keep going, but, uh, it's been over two hours now, which is great. I, I, uh, take a little bit off. I'll take some off for, for, uh, my subscribers. And so a long conversation just gives them a little bit more action. Um, but I really appreciate you coming on and, uh, I definitely appreciate your work and especially really calling out uh, a spade, a spade in terms of the fact that totalitarianism and fascism is probably not just on our doorstep, but actually really running the show right now. And, uh, a lot of people need to wait, not just wake up to the fact that it's actually happening, but get to a place here where you got to be ready to stand up. Uh, before things start to get a lot worse. Um, definitely appreciate it. Do you want to let people know where they can find out more? And, and uh, yeah, let people know where your blog is and, uh, and let them know where they can also find your, your books too. If you do uh, a web search, don't do a Google search because Google's evil. <laughs> Strip, yeah. Strike that <laughs> right. even expression. Just strike that expression. No more Google search. <laughs> yeah. Do a web search. Web search, web search. Do a web search for J. Todd, T-O-D-D, ring, R-I-N-G. And you'll find me in lots of places. Uh, Twitter, you'll find me on Substack. you find uh, me on WordPress, uh, Blogspot. My, my newer essays are on Substack. Uh, you'll find my books on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, I would urge people to go to their local bookstore in person uh, or, or over the internet or look in the phone book, phone them up and say, Hey, I want to order a book through you because I want to support my local independent bookstore. And, uh, yeah, I would urge people to read these. I think they're, I think they can be very, very helpful to us. And one of the key messages is, it is that, I mean, do we want, uh, an increasingly authoritarian elite rule? Uh, you know, that's not going to go well. It's never gone well in the past. It's not going to go well now. And that's, that was what we've got. So if we don't want that, we need to unite the people. You know, it's fine for us to have uh, discussions and have disagreements on political philosophy, ideology, what have you, and on policies and on issues. You know, we can have a lively debate. We can even have a passionate debate. We can even have a heated debate. But then we stop that put it on pause and say, okay, now we're allied together. Now we're united together because everybody who is anti-fascist is on the same team right now. Everybody who's anti-authoritarian, everybody who doesn't want totalitarianism run by a few egomaniac uh, billionaires, we're on the same team. I don't care if you're a liberal, conservative, right libertarian, left libertarian, anarchist, social democrat, green, doesn't matter. If you're anti-authoritarian, if you're anti-fascist, if you think that constitutional democracy, human rights, and freedom are important, then you better speak up and stand up now and start building bridges. Start building alliances. Unite the people across the right and the left. Yeah. The extreme right is fascist. Um, I don't know if you call them extreme left, but on the left, there are uh, totalitarians, authoritarians. 
Mm-hmm. But they're the minority. The the instincts of the greater part of the left lean towards left libertarianism. They're not consistent about it. They can be misled. But they, uh, the greater part of the, the, the populace, left, right, and center, are anti-authoritarian. They're certainly anti-fascist. We need to unite them. I, I think that's the, the central thing I want to say, you know. Um, I would urge people to read my books and my essays because I think they have a lot to bring to bear. Um, and that's one of the central messages. Um, yeah. Unite the people, defeat the fascists, and do it now. Sounds like a plan, Todd. <laughs> really it's not going to be it. easy. It's not going to be quick. But, yeah. you know, it can be done. It will be done. We defeated the fascists 75 years ago. Our parents, our grandparents defeated them. We will defeat them again. So keep the long-term perspective, as uh, as the Dalai Lama says. And uh, remember what Yogi Berra says, it ain't over till it's over. Yeah. Right? So stay Very strong, cool. stay free. All right. And I'll just uh, let everybody know you've been listening to The Shift. I'm your host, Doug McKinty. You can find this episode as well as all other episodes. I, I think I now have uh, getting close to over 200 uh, episodes from a variety of different shows I've done. Uh, and all of that is at www.theshiftnow.com. You can find me at Doug McKinty on Twitter and uh, at D McKinty on Twitter and uh, on Facebook. Actually, my personal page, probably the best place. I'm clinging to Facebook, even though it's not super functional, but I have uh, enough of a, a following still there, despite the censorship, that just looking up Doug McKinty uh on facebook is the way to go but um if you really want to stay in touch you can go to the shiftnow.com sign up for the newsletter and uh you'll get updates with all the new stuff that i've been putting out so great todd thanks for uh, coming on again and reminding everybody uh about uh the history of political philosophy of the fight for freedom against fascism uh and the importance of of uh, really holding on to those ideas of individual rights and and social democracy that's been driving our civilization for the last really 800 years since the magna carta that people seem to be tossing out the window these days so uh thanks for being there to remind them not to do that that's not going to be a good idea yeah we want to you know uh actually heard uh anyway i won't say who it's from but uh somebody define uh a moderate conservatism as not being uh, closed off to positive change, to moving forward or upward, but wanting to uh, be cautious about not sliding backwards. Yeah. Right. So I think at this point, I mean, I think it's wonderful to have a long-term vision. I think it's wonderful to think about political philosophy, social philosophy, what to really generate a vision of what kind of a better world we want to see. And maybe it'll take us 2,000 years, or maybe it'll take us 200 years, or maybe it'll take us 20 years to move in that direction. That's wonderful. But the immediate thing, right? What's the immediate thing? Like, we've got an immediate task at hand. We need to be clear on what that immediate task is. We've got got billionaire oligarchs whose the power has gone to their head. You know, and it's nothing new. You know, it's ugly. We will defeat them. Well, sounds good. Appreciate the conversation, and uh, we'll we'll keep we'll keep working on it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Doug. Very right. very enjoyable. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Take care. You too. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. My conversation with uh, J. Todd Ring uh, of the Enlightened Democracy blog and and author of Enlightened Democracy, the book. Uh, I ran into Todd's work on Twitter and we got to talk and I started checking out a couple of his essays and I was really impressed. I've been trying to go in the direction of left libertarianism in an attempt to create a cohesive political philosophy that can really embrace a lot of different people from a lot of different perspectives. I think that we're getting to a place where we are really need to stop arguing about stuff, about every little detail, uh, about how government should be run. I mean, I've just uh, run, I've just been amazed uh, over the last year or so at how I've been having to argue the minutiae of my own personal healthcare choices 
right? And all the time I'm spending on social media saying, no, I think this treatment protocol is better than that treatment protocol or whatever. And it's just like, why should we even be arguing about this? I mean, this is private, personal healthcare information. It's not up to the collective to decide for everyone, every little aspect of your daily routine and what you want to do with your life. And um, I think it's just been amazing the rise in the current modern day political left, especially I think those who identify as the progressive left, to believe that the government just has sort of a carte blanche uh, power to make these kinds of decisions for you, to decide the treatments that you get in terms of the health care that you want to choose for yourself, the kind of education that you want uh, for your kids. Uh, I mean, just across the board, every aspect of our lives, it seems that the progressive left has really taken this philosophical stance that the government and the, the hierarchy, the patriarchal hierarchy that is the government corporate complex, uses science to determine the best solutions for everyone. And then, if everyone doesn't uh, choose to participate in those solutions, well, then they're somehow unvirtuous, or uh, they're working against the public good, or they don't care, they're selfish, they don't care about the, the community's well-being. Um, it doesn't really make a heck of a lot of sense to me. I mean, to me, everybody's different. Uh, we're all in different places, different different settings. We have uh, different healthcare histories. Uh, we have different uh, cultural backgrounds that maybe warrant a different type of education. Uh, our children have different needs. Uh, I don't understand this notion that there's some kind of objective... Uh, answer to all of life's questions that the government can come up with and then everyone has to comply or else they they lack virtue, right? They're bad people if they don't comply. Uh, the government is always correct. Uh, and then, of course, when COVID hit, you know, we're really seeing this backlash for people who are fighting for uh, the ability to make these individual choices about their personal life. Uh, saying that people are selfish. Uh, I've heard comparisons, you know, with communist countries saying they have a we culture. Americans have this individualistic, selfish culture, and that's why, you know, we didn't lock down hard enough, early enough. Uh, we're making poor decisions uh, about how to deal with the current uh, healthcare crisis that uh, has been thrust upon us here. Um, and it's just been boggling my mind. And anyone that comes up with alternative ideas, like, hey, you know, maybe early treatment is better than not treating a disease, an infection at all, until you get so sick that you require hospitalization. Well, oh, no, that's, you know, that's not what the government says. And so uh, arguing in favor of, of treating a, a disease early uh, rather than waiting is, uh, you know, a, a horrible idea. There's no scientific proof, even though they do it in other countries and it works great. And there's dozens and dozens of peer-reviewed papers saying that, you know, lots of different early treatments could be an option. It's just become mass insanity. So uh, I started reading Todd's work and I wanted to have him on because he is just reminding people on the left that like, hey guys, we come from this long tradition uh, that includes the individual's right to make personal decisions like this on their own. And he uh, seems to be able to bear witness to the understanding that I think is slipping from a lot of people on the left these days, that when you give governments uh, this kind of centralized power, it just never goes well, right? I mean, that you slip into fascism, you slip into totalitarianism and authoritarianism, just, uh, you know, very quickly, once you give up on that idea that there are certain boundaries that the government cannot cross when it comes to the ability for the individual to make choices for themselves. So uh, I was excited to have him on. I've been uh, dabbling with this concept of agorism. I had Sal Merriweather on, Mayweather on, excuse me, and I had uh, Derek Bros on to discuss uh, the idea of agorism, which is just to basically, you know, leave the system and participate um, outside the system using gray and black markets and just not purchasing from the corporate and government monopolies, uh, the oligarchy, you know, in installed economic system that really, um, that really uh, helps the, the upper class uh, and leaves the rest of us kind of out of the game. Uh, but I wanted to have Todd on because he really approaches it actually from a more left-wing perspective. Derek and Sal uh, were more sort of free market, 
libertarians. And this I wanted to delve into this concept of left libertarianism. And I think Todd uh, does a great job of doing that, not only by setting up the classical liberal tradition, which consistently guys like Henry David Thoreau, uh, guys like Thomas Paine, uh, philosophers like Voltaire, uh, and John Locke, uh, describing why we need to set up these boundaries between uh, in the individual's freedom and state power. Uh, and also, he's not afraid to call out the coming, uh, I wouldn't even call it coming, I don't think he would either. I mean, he's been warning about the, the coming fascism for the last 20, 30 years, and lo and behold, it really appears like it's here now. So uh, this interview is kind of a call to wake people up to say, hey, uh, this is pretty serious. We've now gotten to a point where a state and corporate power has become so consolidated that they're just calling the shots. Uh, and these uh, progress, these members of the progressive left are going right along with it and calling people who uh, don't want to follow uh, the centralized power structure uh, extremists, uh, unscientific, despite, again, the plethora of scientific evidence that could easily disagree with their point of view, uh, and even unwilling to have uh, logical conversation or a critical analysis uh, of uh, the government's decision-making processes, and no seeming concept that the government could be corrupted. We discussed this in the interview, that, um, you know, how how they could think that there's no such thing, I guess, as corporate capture or have concerns that organizations like the CDC and the FDA uh, could possibly be manipulated by the billions of dollars that flow through these organizations straight to the corporate corporations that they're supposed to be regulating uh, and the revolving door course that occurs between these agencies and, uh, and the corporations, again, that they're supposed to be uh, keeping track of, con in control of, um, you know, uh, forming these regulations to make sure that they don't get out of control. Well, it seems like things are really, really out of control. Uh, and certain portions of the left, the modern left, uh, are unwilling to admit that the current system simply isn't working. Um, and the other thing I liked about Todd's work is that he's really looking just like I am, and I do tend to come more from that right libertarian tradition. He comes from a very left-leaning uh, libertarian tradition, and we're really meeting each other in the middle to try to create this really big tent. Like, I am just so tired of arguing with people, uh, again, about the minutiae of my personal health care or education choices or my opinions about how I should live my life as if it's some kind of a, every, every little aspect has to be a huge public debate and we have to come up to some kind of, come up with some kind of consensus that everybody has to follow. I mean, this is a, a patriarchal mythology, like... Um, and I don't think a lot of people on the left even see that they've gotten kind of sucked into this. Uh, and they do perceive it as virtuous to support what they're supporting because they just have such a, an unbridled faith in the hierarchy that those at the, the, and, and believe that those at the top of the hierarchy must be working for the public good. Um, but the creation of this Big Ten, I think, is really important. And what Todd and I discussed is this concept of decentralization. So we want to just decentralize power. Like, let's have these arguments at the local level. You know, let's not try to pretend like there's a, a national or a world government that's going to come up with the answer to all of our problems for every community all over the world or, you know, every community in our state. On the community level, we can argue how much do we want to enforce a certain certain uh, educational parameters? How much do we want to have uh, a kind of a pu public health care apparatus or a social safety net? And then uh, we can have uh, examples of each individual community coming up with different solutions. And that would just make it a lot easier to see which ones are actually working, which ones don't work. Um, and ultimately evolve uh, as a human race. Not only that, but on a local level, you know your neighbors, you know your friends, uh, you're able to have these conversations with people that you know. It's not like uh, voting through some electronic voting machine that then chooses someone uh, to represent you a thousand miles away or several thousand miles away where they're influenced by billions of dollars worth of corporate finance uh, to vote one way or the other as if this is a real solution for your community's problems. Instead, you know uh, each individual that you're debating with, that you're having these conversations with, you, you, know, you know and trust each other. 
And uh, so you're trying to move forward in a good way and having that intention will create better governance. Um, and so the hope of this interview was really to create exactly that, like a, a political philosophy that can create this big tent around the concept that, at least on these federal levels, on these higher levels, this, this centralization of power is very dangerous, leads to authoritarianism and totalitarianism. We want to decentralize power and then have these conversations at this local level. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this as much as, as I did. I'd like to have Todd back on uh, later to keep this conversation flowing because I think that we're starting to get onto something and I know that we need to create this big tent based on a concept of decentralization of power, both corporate and government, uh, to, to get over the hump with this crisis that we're in. And if we don't stand up against it, it's just going to keep on coming and coming and coming until we wake up and we really realize what totalitarianism feels like. Uh, and I don't think that that's going to be healthy for any of us as individuals, and it won't be good for any of us on a community level either. So uh, again, I hope you enjoy these concepts as much as I do. Just want to remind you that you can find Todd's stuff at www.jtoddring.substack.com. He's been producing quite a bit. Seems like a, an article once a week or so. So, uh, And you can go on there. You can certainly get the gist of his... Uh, his personal philosophy and a lot of good history and a lot of good uh, political philosophy there just to educate yourself as well. Uh, and um, so I urge you all to check out his work and then go to, of course, as always, www.theshiftnow.com where you can find all of my stuff, including this interview and uh, hundreds of hours of free content. Uh, think about signing up for the newsletter and I'll keep you up to date with all the new content that I am continuing to come out with. So uh, I know I had a little bit of a slow October. Uh, I have a bunch of interviews trying to play uh, catch up. I had a couple people cancel on me last month at the at the last minute, slow November, excuse me, and uh, so I've got a bunch of content coming out to catch up. So you guys can stay tuned for that. My next uh, my next episode is with the great Dr. Cynthia McKinney, another left wing figure uh, that I'm trying to continue to reach out to, to find out where uh, our, our commonalities are and where we can start building an actual movement here that can be effective against, uh, you know, the Great Reset, what's going on, what we're just watching happen right in front of our faces. So again, uh, you can go to www.theshiftnow.com and find all of that material. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, my, my personal page, Doug McKinty, uh, or go to at McKinty on Twitter. I'm also on Rockfin, Odyssey, and YouTube. Um, I'm kind of urging people to go to rockfin.com and look uh, look up the shift or at the shift now, and you'll find me there because that's a great free speech platform that's been working well for me. Um, and uh, other than that, I'm actually probably going to have this. I have a couple in the can. The Cynthia McKinney episode will be out in just a couple of days, so stay tuned for that. All right, thanks everybody for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Take care. <laughs>